Good afternoon, everyone. If you're just joining us, um, welcome to the Adaptation Planning Guide and CalADAPT Sierra Nevada Regional Workshop. We'll just give it another minute or so to let folks trickle in here. In the meantime, if you're so inclined, you're welcome to change your display name to include the organization you work for or some other representation of where you're from. We'd love to know. All right, looks like we've got we've got quite a few folks now on the line. So um, welcome everyone. Just wanted to say hi, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Nikki Caravelli with the Office of Planning and Research. Um, I'm joined here by colleagues from the UC Berkeley Geospatial Innovation Facility and Sierra Business Council helping to put on um, this workshop. So without further ado, I think I'm going to turn it over to Simone from Sierra Business Council to introduce this workshop, but welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Nikki, I appreciate it. Um, hi everyone, my name is Simone Cordery Cotter. I am a climate analyst with Sierra Business Council. I'm gonna share my screen really briefly. I have a quick, um, just a couple slides to get us started. And I'm gonna sincerely hope that it pulls up the correct screen. Is everybody seeing my presentation screen and not my notes? Thanks, Lucy. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanna say welcome to all of you. I'm so excited that we have so many people here for this webinar. Um, I wanted to give a very heartfelt thank you to Nikki Caravelli and the team at the Office of Planning and Research, as well as Nancy Thomas and Lucy Andrews at the Geospatial Innovation Facility at UC Berkeley. And I'd also especially like to thank um, Jason Mogadas from Spatial Informatics Group and to Owen Doherty who had um, a vision for this type of workshop um, before we were all impacted by COVID-19, it looks very different from what we were planning, but we're very grateful um, that we're all able to be here and to everyone who is able to be here. So thank you. Um, just a few housekeeping things um, that I continually hope are becoming second nature to folks, but after listening to someone discuss their haircut on a statewide phone call without realizing that they weren't on mute, um, I assume that we're all still learning a little more each day. Um, so the creature on this slide is the majestic Malamute. Um, it is your best friend and ensures an enjoyable audible experience for everyone else. Um, keep in mind that this is a meeting format rather than a webinar format, and so we ask that you ensure that you are on mute when you are not actively speaking, um, and that makes it much easier for us to make the recording available to folks and makes it much easier for um, our very um, highly qualified and highly intelligent and exciting presenters to be heard and understood, so thank you. Um, please put any questions as we go along in the chat box as we move through the presentations. We'll be sure to get to them um, and uh, uh, we will have um, a couple other opportunities to take um, additional feedback and questions as we go through the remainder of the presentation and the webinar. Um, just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and um, Nikki, please confirm, I believe the recording will be made available afterward, correct? Yes, we can make the uh, excuse me the recording and also the slides available to anyone who registered for this workshop. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so just I want to just take a quick minute um, and I'm not going to pretend that what's going on outside of this meeting isn't unnerving or anxiety inducing. I know that everybody who is here is here for a reason and is, and cares deeply about climate action and climate data and how we utilize the best science available um, and the best tools available to us to ensure that we're protecting and um, and protecting our communities and mitigating climate change and adapting to what we understand is going to be an increasingly volatile and changing world um, statewide we've got what's proving to be a record-setting fire season there feels like 
there feels like little to no support on some of our most urgent and social environmental issues from the federal government. Our friends and family are dealing with the economic fallout of some of that lack of leadership and even our places of retreat and safety that were our homes have become our offices, our schools, our gyms. Um, so I want to acknowledge that this is a, this is quite frankly an insane time. Um, but for every for if it's helpful, um, you are here, and um, you will be in this moment with us and in this webinar with us, um, learning about how you can continue to um, be make meaningful impact and meaningful change in your community and in your region and in your state. And we're very lucky that we have the group of experts here um, that we do today. So I would highly encourage you to take copious notes, ask lots of questions, your, feel free to get everybody's contact info that you can. Um, and uh, let, us, let us together, in the words of Jessica Morse, our Deputy Secretary of Natural Resources, who gave a webinar a couple of weeks ago, she said, we're, we're kind of in it. We're in it. We're in the difficulty where we need to make a better world for tomorrow. So I want to thank you all for being here and um, taking the time to, to make, take those first couple steps or continue that journey that you're already on. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, hand it over to the next person who's talking, who I think is Lucy. Am I correct? Indeed. Yay. It's me. Hi, everybody. My name is Lucy, and I'm with the Geospatial Innovation Facility at Berkeley, the team that has put together and continues to maintain the CALADAPT website. We're going to focus the first portion of this webinar on the CALADAPT stuff. Um, namely, we'll start with a demo of a wildfire tool that we have. Nancy Thomas, my colleague, will offer that to us. And then we'll go into some breakout groups to discuss how you access climate data and what your hopes for data access will be in the future, um, knowing that we at CalAdapt are always looking for recommendations on how we can better serve California. Um, I'm gonna set up the logistics of those breakout groups right now before I turn it over to Nancy um, and then we'll get going. So as I share my screen, I wanna first um, throw up the faces of my colleagues. We've got uh, a whole crew of folks here from CalAdapt. Um, my colleagues and I will be facilitating the breakout sessions. And in the interest of time, I'll let them introduce themselves in those breakout sessions. But I just wanted to let you know you're supported by these folks. And when you email us at our support address or you read the stuff on the site, um, there's a whole bunch of people uh, working every day to make that information accessible to you. Uh, let's see. So a quick note on breakout groups. We're going to set those up now so that the tech admin on this webinar have time to actually assign people to breakout groups. We'll have four breakout groups in which we'll have facilitated discussions about themes relevant to climate change adaptation data and CalAdapt. The first breakout group will discuss the forthcoming local climate change snapshot tool a tool that will allow you to pick a place in the state of California and very quickly get a display of projected climate change impacts for that location. That's really meant to support something like the Adaptation Planning Guide 2.0 process um, and serve to make um, climate change impact information available across California more easily. The second breakout group will discuss the types of uh, support, planning guidance, and other um, sort of more technical information that make climate data useful to folks in the adaptation community. So what um, additional stuff beyond simply the data itself do you need to be able to interpret the information for your purposes? The third group will discuss uh, changing hydrology and drought projections in the state of California and how a platform like CalAdapt can represent water resources information for the state of California. And then the fourth breakout group will discuss how folks can access climate change projections hosted on CalAdapt through tools um, R, the programming language, and ArcGIS. So take a quick minute to note which breakout group you'd like to participate in, and then change your display name to read that breakout group after your own personal name. So for example, I'll do mine right now. I will be working with the guidance team. So I've changed my name to read Lucy hyphen guide. That way uh, we can make breakout groups associated with each, um, each theme. You can only participate in one breakout group this time around, 
but we'll be sure to share back between the breakout groups and distribute our notes to everybody after this webinar. If you have questions about that, feel free to send me a private message in the chat and you and I can go back and forth. All right, with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll turn it over to Nancy for her to share her screen and talk to us about CalAdapt and our wildfire tool. Great, thanks so much, Lucy. Let me just make sure I can share. All right. And let's see, you can probably see my slides. Um, let me know if you see the uh, notes or just the slides. Lucy, does that look good? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much. This is really exciting. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Thanks Simone for that great uh, introduction. Um, I know it is a little bit of a crazy time these days, so we really appreciate your time to get together and talk about climate data and climate adaptation. So I'm going to be talking about CalAdapt. Um, I do want to mention that our team at the Geospatial Innovation Facility were the, the developers of CalAdapt and also of the uh, California, the adaptation um, guide that we'll be, we're going to be talking about later. So I want to uh, put a shout out to our web developers for um, working on both of those projects. So a few things about CalAdapt. I think most of you are familiar with it, um, but our goal at CalAdapt is to present complex climate change information and make it easy for people to use. Um, I want to thank our funders. We are funded through the California Energy Commission and also the California Strategic Growth Council. And I also want to point out that at CalAdapt, what we do is showcase climate data that's been created by uh, researchers throughout California. So we always want to thank the data providers for uh, doing the work on creating the climate models that we showcase on CalAdapt. So we at CalAdapt are part of California's fourth climate change assessment. So as a part of the fourth assessment, our role is to make all of the climate change projections available for people to use and to make them easier for people to use and understand. So all of the data that you find on CalAdapt is peer reviewed and it's all data that's been um, that's been used by the state of California for climate change planning. So that's one of our, our key um, features of CalAdapt is that the data is um, state data and that it's used for state planning purposes. So we are, our goal is always to make this complex climate change data useful, accessible and actionable for people. So we do that in a number of different ways. We present interactive data visualizations that show you maps and charts. You can use your own uh, boundary files. You can use some preloaded boundary files. So it's easy to really jump in and explore the climate data, even if you're a novice climate data user. We also make the data easily accessible by describing the data with plain English. So we try to make it really understandable for folks without having so much text on each tool that it's really unreadable. So we're always trying to get a fine line there about making presenting complicated information and making it easy for people to understand. So that's always our goal. So one of the things that uh, Simone had mentioned we wanted to talk about today, especially is how to really access data through CalAdapt and how to download that data for your own uses and your own purposes. And we have a wide variety of users at CalAdapt. So we make the data available in a, a wide variety of different ways for different types of users. So within each of our climate tools, our main data visualizations, you can always download the data directly from the climate tools. And I'll show you how to do that today. That's actually the easiest way to grab data from CalAdapt and use it in your own reports or, um, or presentations. We also make the data available through an open, free and open API application programming interface. So if you're someone who is familiar with using um, Python or JavaScript or some sort of coding language, you can actually really customize your data downloads. 
Um, so that's a really great feature. If you have a little bit of programming experience, you can uh, grab the data from CalAdapt and really customize it to your own needs. And then the third option for getting data and really accessing and downloading data is through our data download tool. And this is sort of a midway feature. It allows you to access many of the capabilities of that API to customize your data, but you can do it within a GUI interface. So you don't have to write any computer code, but you still are able to customize the data for your own region and time period. So with that, I'm going to do a demo of CalAdapt today. And what we learned in our user survey is that most people are really interested in our wildfire tool. So that's what I'm going to be demoing today. So I want to talk, obviously, you know, fire is a, a big um, point of discussion and really prevalent in all of our lives right now. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the data set that we're using to display in the wildfire tool. Um, so we are looking at the fourth assessment data sets that were produced by Dr. Leroy Westerling at UC Merced. So his modeling technique uses a statistical model that's based on historical large wildfires. Um, so he's looking at large wildfires and using that to run models to look at projected data in the future. So the wildfire projections are um, many Monte Carlo simulations. So they run models um, and have a hundred different variety of outputs. And there are, they're running models based on a number of input variables. So there are four global climate models or GCMs that are run uh, for the Westerling data. There are two RCPs, um, that's the emission scenarios. I'll talk about that a little bit more. There are three different population growth scenarios, and then there are 10 different land use cover scenarios. So it's quite a complicated data set. Um, again, there's a lot of different simulations and a lot of different variables that can change. And you can look at the results for any of those different combinations. There are two different data layers that are included in our wildfire tool. One is the annual and monthly average area projected to burn. Now that's the fourth assessment data set that was created by the Merced team. And again, that's run both at an annual and at a monthly time step. Um, and then our team at the GIF has done a little additional modeling with that work to create um, an output that's a decadal wildfire probability. And what that is using is those 100 Monte Carlo simulations that are run for each of the individual um, combinations of data. So that's something they both, both of those data sets exist on our tool. And I'll talk a little bit more about some wildfire work that is upcoming in uh, a few minutes. So now what I want to do is jump ahead to CalAdapt itself. So you can access CalAdapt at cal-adapt.org. And I'm going to do a little bit um, to, to go through the landing page with you, and then we'll jump into uh, particular tools. So for you, for those of you who maybe haven't seen or haven't used CalAdapt before, one of the features of CalAdapt is that we look at many different climate impacts. There are a lot of different climate tools out there that really dig into one single climate variable. Um, there are some great tools out there that look at, uh, that look at uh, sea level rise, for example, or fire. We look at many different types of climate change. So you can look at um, snowpack, drought scenarios, extreme heat, extreme precipitation. So I hope you can spend a little time and explore some of these tools um, on your own. We, let's see, we have on our main landing page, we always show um, some of our new, the newest things we're working on. CalAdapt is continuously under development. So we always have new data and new tools available. So you can find them on the main page. We have many different ways for people to jump into the data. Again, you can look at the climate tools, which are the data visualizations. If you're someone who knows what you want and just want to access and download the data, you can go directly to that. Um, and there's also many different resources that we have available. We'll look at those um, in a few minutes as we go along. 
I also want to point out a few other things. I mentioned that we have the open source API if you want to do some coding to get your own custom tools. And you can look here at the API documentation um, to if you want to use some of those um, programming type methods of accessing data. One of the things that we're always really happy about is a series of cookbooks that we've created using Jupyter Notebooks. If you want to, you know, really fine tune the data for your own uses, this is a really great uh, way to look at the data and look at guides on how to write code to get the type of data that you're interested in. So for those of you who um, are interested in that, that's a really, really great resource. And with that, a few other things I want to point out on the landing page that we have a Caladap newsletter. If you're interested in seeing our new tools, um, getting an announcement of any upcoming webinars or trainings we might have, I recommend that you uh, sign up for the newsletter. We don't send out information very often, but um, we do like to send out new, new data and tools that way. We also have a survey um, on this site. If you want to give us some feedback on how Caladap works for you, and if you want to see any additional data or tools, uh, please take a few minutes to fill out the survey. That's always really helpful for us. And with that, I'm gonna jump into looking at the tools. So as I mentioned, we have visualization tools for many different climate impacts. All of the climate impacts include two different emission scenarios that are used in California's fourth assessment. So there's uh, the lower emission scenario, which is called RCP 4.5. And then there's a higher emission scenario in which emissions continue to rise throughout the 21st century, and that's RCP 8.5. So all of our tools allow you to explore um, a variety of possible climate futures, because of course we um, don't really know what the future will bring. So I often look at the extreme heat tool when I do a demo. That's probably our most popular tool and is really interesting to look at. But since we have had such an interest in wildfire, that's the one that I'm gonna look at today. So I can just click on the tool. And as I mentioned before, this is actually quite a complicated data set with many different options. So I'm gonna walk you through all of the different parameters and then we'll, I'll show you how to play around with the tool a bit. So the first thing that a user can do when coming to the wildfire tool, you'll see that there's two different tabs on top. One is this area burned. Um, again, this is the average area burned um, in a historical time frame and then projected out into the future. And then from that, we created these decadal fire probabilities. We're going to look at the area burned today. Another thing that you can do with this tool that we are trying to add into more and more of our tools as we're building them is a take a tour. So if you come back to the wildfire tool and you're a little confused about what you can do and how to get the, the data that you're interested in, you can follow along and this really steps you through all of the different features and parameters in this tool. So uh, beyond the, the tabs at the top, the different parameters that I mentioned are all available for users to um, explore whatever information they're interested in. So for example, I mentioned that this data set is run on both an annual and a monthly time step. So the user can choose which of those they want to look at. There are three different population growth scenarios, uh, high, central, and low. There's the two different RCP or emission scenarios that I mentioned. And then with all of our Caladap tools, you can aggregate the data by different boundary layers. And we'll come back and take, to take a look at that in a minute. Scrolling down, I want to really showcase the, the main features of the tool, which are our animated map, um, which allows you to play this um, acreage burned over time from the 1950s over to the end of the century. And it matches this graph that we have, which is also is looking at, again, area burned, decadal averages over this whole time frame. So we're, this is showing us decadal area burned, uh, estimated for each um, area of interest. So these two interact. As a user, you can actually click on the pixels. 
And you'll see that we're showing information for a new grid cell. Zoom in. Um, and then we can also play this animation. Actually, it's nice to look at the entire state when we do this. Um, so it's pretty interesting to see how, what different areas of the state are predicted to increase in their acreage burned. And you can really explore this in a number of different ways. So you'll see that you're also seeing the same information on this chart um, in a slightly different form. We can also pick different models to look at. So you'll see that we currently are looking at um, one of these uh, GCMs, but you can also choose different, different GCMs to look at and play those over the map animation. Um, the graphic is showing you all four of the models that were run. So those are all of the four models run with the wildfire data. And um, the four models are described right underneath. These are the priority models that were used for the research in California's fourth assessment. So most um, data sets that you see from the fourth assessment will include at least these four models. There are 32 GCMs that were run overall. Um, so some tools you'll see include all, um, include 10 models that were projected for California and some include um, these four recommended models. And then at the bottom of all of our tools, we describe the data sets that are used to create the data visualization. So this is all really important. As I mentioned, we are looking at peer reviewed data. So this is a you know, scientifically rigorous data set. So we do a, a description of the data and then we also link to the citations or references. So if you're interested in learning more about the wildfire simulations and how, what are the inputs are and how that data set was created, you can click on that link. And this is the paper from the fourth assessment um, on that particular data set. So that is always handy to have. And with that, I'm going to play around with this a little bit more and show you how you can use this tool for looking at your area of interest. So as I mentioned, most of our user controls are on the top. I'm just gonna leave the annual simulation, the central growth scenario. Um, we can leave the RCP for now, but I do wanna look at the different aggregation layers. So what we're currently looking at is just the, the pixel grid cells themselves with no spatial aggregation. But typically people want to look at some sort of boundary layer. So we include many different optional boundary layers on here for users. Places will take you to um, individual cities, uh, census tracts, watersheds, uh, counties maybe is um, one of the more useful ones. So I can pull up the county layers. We can zoom in a little if we like. Um, and then what we do is select what we're interested in looking at on the map. And now you'll see that my, um, my chart has dynamically updated for that region. You can actually see, I can look at other counties. And again, that uh, the map is, uh, the chart is dynamically updating for the region that we're looking at. So when we use those boundary layers, what we're doing is aggregating all of the grid cells within that boundary layer. And now we're getting averages across the study area. So again, what we're looking at with this particular data set is the area burned. So there is historical data, um, historical model data that was again created from that large wildfire data set. And then the modeling work looks at how is that projected to change in the future. So we'll see that for many locations, we are seeing an expected increase in the acreage burned in different areas. Now you'll also see we have this quick stat bar. Um, what we're showing here is 30 year time periods. When you think about climate change data, climate scientists scientists typically look at 30 year time periods. Um, it's really not recommended to look at say a single year uh, projected into the future. So we have these different year ranges. And as a user, you can change these. So right now the tool is giving us 
the um, output for the modeled historical. So that's our past time period and then our mid-century. So that's our mid-century projections. And as a user, you can look at, you know, perhaps what's the average uh, acreage burned within that time period and what is that average estimated to be in the future. Um, you can also change the year range. So we have a few defaults. Most of our users really want to look at historical, mid-century, and then end of century. You can also select your own custom time range if you're interested in some other uh, time period. But with that, you can change to the end of century and look at how your projected area burned is expected to change. We can also look at the difference between this uh, medium scenario, RCP 4.5, and the high emissions scenario. So that um, you'll see that we have quite an increase in that estimated average um, hectares burned. A couple other things about the tool that I want to point out, and this is true with all of our CALADAP tools. Oh, for one thing, I do want to point out that you can look at the data by decade or by year. So you'll see that this time, time series is now actually looking at a yearly time interval. And you'll see that that's quite noisy. You know, there is a lot of variety and variation within these wildfire projections. And that is really apparent when you start to look at it on an individual year basis. So you can choose either of those, um, whatever works for the data that you're interested in. So a few other things that you can do. Within each of our tools, you can always save out the chart so if you want to just take this information and perhaps put it into a report or presentation, you can always just export that as an image. It tells you what emission scenario you're looking at, what the area is. Right now we're at Sierra County. Um, so that's really one that's in some ways the easiest way to grab the data. We can also get the data. And what this is doing is it's giving us a CSV file of all of the data that's used to make up this particular chart. And I'll just show you what this is. So once again, um, this shows you what county you're in, what RCP, and it's actually giving you a spreadsheet of all of those different values for each of the different models for the entire time series. And this is really useful. We found that most of our users actually use this type of data. So they want just a spreadsheet that they can then um, do their own analysis with for their own area of interest. So uh, that is really handy. And I always like for users to know that that's a possibility. Again, within each of our different tools, you can always do that. So with that, I'm going to move on to how we can access data in different ways. So it's easy to get that CSV file, but perhaps you're a user who wants to customize the data a little bit more. Maybe you want to use your own shape file and aggregate over a particular number of years. Um, maybe you want to get a raster file that you can download into a GIS. For any of those options, you can go directly to our data tool. This describes, again, those three different ways that you can download data in CalADAPT. We just looked at exporting data from charts. We looked at the API documentation. Now we're going to look at the data download tool itself. <coughs> so with the data download tool, we have a lot of different options. So you can, first of all, just see how many different data sets are actually available on CalADAPT. There's a lot of different stuff here. You can just go to the climate variables and look for what you're interested in. Again, we have a lot of different data on CalADAPT um, for different types of climate change and climate impacts. So right now, if we're interested in wildfire, we can click on that. And you'll see that there are two different products that come up. This first one is the decadal wildfire probability maps that I mentioned. Those were um, created from Dr. Westerling's data um, with a little bit of additional processing that we did at the GIF. The data that we just looked at, the uh, average area burned is this data set, so we can select that. So what comes up is your, basically your metadata for that data set. So it gives you a brief description, tells you who created the data, what the variables are, what scenarios are available, and what GCMs are available. 
as well as the reference for the data. So all of that is available. And then as a user, you choose how you want that data. So if you're actually interested in the primary scientific data um, direct from UC Merced, you can actually go to our data server and download the source data. If you're interested in uh, doing more aggregation temporally and spatially, you can use one of our um, different tools here. So if you want raster data, so if you're interested in GeoTIFF format, you can click on the raster format and go through that way to download data that you could input into a GIS. If you're interested in tabular data, you would click on this. And here you can select once again, what, what boundary layer you want to use. So again, I could look at, at counties or places or watersheds, or I can upload my own shapefile or points. And this is something that I think is really great, uh, a really great feature of CalAdapt that is not always the case with other climate tools. So you can look at your own area of interest. Um, for, we can also draw on the map. So for now, I'm just going to draw a feature on the map and use this as my study area. And then I say next. If sometimes the features are a little too big to be able to download, process and download it. So if you draw something, you know, that's a really huge polygon, it might be too large and you'll get a message here, but this one is supported. So I can say next. And now I have all of these different um, time series for that wildfire data. Um, and we can look at it, we can look at filtering it in a couple different ways. So for example, the first choice is which of those GCMs do you want to download? Maybe you, you might want all four, or maybe you just want to look at one individual one. Um, I'm just going to look at the one that is the hot dry model. So I'm going to select that. You can also choose any of those scenarios. So you could choose all of them or just one at a time. I'll show you what it looks like with all of them. And then the temporal resolution could be a little um, interesting. So several of our data sets are run on a daily time step. The wildfire data is uh, monthly, not daily. So if I select a daily, you'll see it would actually say no time series match the search because it's not a daily data set. But there is a monthly version. So I can click on monthly. And then a couple other things that I can do here. This is something else that I think is really uh, cool that I don't know if most people are aware of. We can then actually aggregate this data in a number of different ways. For example, you might actually be interested in a water year as opposed to a calendar year data set. So that's something that you can run here. Or you might actually be interested in seasonal data. Um, I know with wildfire, this can be particularly interesting. So I'm going to select seasonal. And that temporal aggregation is going to be done for you by this tool. Um, a couple other things we could do, we could actually change the units. You might have noticed that our original units are in hectares. If I actually want acres, I can change it to the imperial units. Um, just for the example, I'm going to select one of these data sets and say download. And I've already run it. It actually only takes a minute to do, but I'm going to show you. I've already unzipped the result. So here is your data set. Um, it is pretty interesting. So now we're looking at, you'll see that the time period is showing us the months, the starting point. <laughs> the month. uh -oh. Sorry about that. Um, and now we're, again, we're looking at seasonal data. So we're looking at, uh, we get three, um, each of these is taking care, is looking at three months of a time period. Sorry, sorry about my dog barking there. Uh, we always have that with Zoom. <laughs> so this is really cool. Um, again, I'm not sure that users are aware of some of the capabilities of the different aggregations with the data. So I always like to show that off. And there's, I just have maybe a few minutes left. So I'm gonna show you just a few more things about the website in general. One is our blog. So on the CalAdapt blog, there's a lot of great resources, including the webinars that we hold. So we do a fairly regular series of webinars with CalAdapt. Um, 
which look at a variety of different things. Our last one was our most popular, uh, an introduction to climate data. So if you want to learn a little bit more about climate data, what the projections mean, how to use it, this was a really great webinar. Our partner, Owen Doherty, who's with us today, uh, our chief scientist, uh, did most of the work on that webinar. So it's really useful if you just want to learn more about climate data in general. We do have an upcoming webinar um, that we are just announcing today, which is actually going to showcase the wildfire data and the data provider, uh, Dr. Westerling, is going to be present, and also the Pyrogens Consortium. There's a lot of work being done on the next generation climate data. So if you're interested in learning more about wildfire data in general and what's coming up with the next round of wildfire modeling, um, you might want to join us for that webinar. Lucy, I'm wondering if you can uh, put the link to that webinar registration in the chat. A couple other things we have on this page, we have blog posts that sort of describe our different tools um, as we're building them. There's a really great tool, the Maps of Projected Change, that's allowing you to map uh, climate anomalies. And if you're interested in using that tool and maybe you're a little confused by it, you can look at the blog post to learn more. So lots of great things there. And then just as a final step, I want to show you our help page. We have some great resources from uh, Catherine Davis Reich at UCLA on using climate projections. So if you're a new user, you maybe are a little unfamiliar with climate change science and data, this is a really great resource. It's um, pretty easy to read some information about climate projections, how they're made, what they are, how to use them. I really recommend this as a great starting point for learning more about climate change data. We have a frequently asked questions that we are uh, adding more to all the time. Um, so hopefully that can help you if you're working with data. And then you can always contact us directly. You could email me at anythomas at berkeley.edu or our support email. Um, our web developers usually answer the support email and are really, really helpful if you have any questions as you're working through the tools. So with that, um, hopefully that gives you a good overview. I know there's always many, many questions, particularly about that wildfire data, um, that people would like to see more information and are really interested in what that tool is showing. Again, we are doing a webinar in I think about two weeks that specifically is focused on wildfire, both the current fourth assessment data and the next set of next generation wildfire data. So please join us for that if you can. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, I don't know if we have time for any questions or if we have anything in particular. Yeah, if folks want to ask any questions, feel free to put them in chat. And I'd also like to warm us up for the breakout groups. We're hoping that they're very interactive, um, some exciting conversations. And so we're just going to start off uh, by getting to know each other in this big group with some polls. So you're going to see some Zoom polls popping up. Uh, please answer them. The first one, Nikki, if I could have you put this up on the screen for everybody, is where are you working? Um, take a few seconds here, answer the questions, and we'll see the results as a group. In my case, I'm calling in from Chicago at the moment, though my work is in the Bay Area, so I'll hit other. And then Nikki, when you see a critical mass of answers, feel free to pop up the results. Give it about 15 more seconds here. Thanks. Okay, wrapping up. All right, so we've got a lot of folks from the central part of the Sierra. Um, sizable group of people also marked other, but there's a sprinkling of, of geographic representation for many different regions in the Sierra too. All right, we got another poll coming up. Uh, the second is, what's the focus of your work? What sector do you concentrate on most? Knowing that a lot of this is intersectional, uh, pick the one that's, that's your favorite or takes up the most of your time. Yeah. 
It looks like 10 more seconds. All right, looking at this one, uh, the plurality of folks call themselves uh, as working in natural resource management uh, with other folks in land use and community development, a subset in energy, but some representation certainly uh, of agricultural context, climate justice context, emergency management, a few others. I don't think it's surprising that we don't have any oceans or coast folks here. Um, Sierra's a little far from that, so. All right, another one for us is where do you work in an organizational context? Do you work for a city government, a state agency, a business knowing that this is um, a convening by the Sierra Business Council and there are many different entities represented. So what's yours? Wrapping up in five seconds. We're getting faster with the Zoom polls. Way to go people. <laughs> All right, it's neck and neck between state government and local government represented here. Um, we have some consultants, some NGO folks, um, and then a handful of people from academic research and private industry context. So good to see that spread, kind of fun to know that we'll get insight from many different organizational contexts. Uh, the next one is how familiar do you consider yourself to be with climate science and climate data? Knowing that there's no judgment from our end, we're just curious, um, knowing that this is a subject on everybody's minds here today. How would you peg yourself? Five more seconds. I put on the final countdown. <laughs> Mostly kidding. All right. We've got a uh, middling crowd the majority of folks would say that they're somewhat familiar with climate science and about 10% say not at all familiar. And I just want to say welcome. We're so glad you're here. Um, one of our goals here is to help you find the resources to develop greater familiarity. Uh, and then the last one from our end of things at the CalAdapt team is how do you access climate data and how do you use it? Are there software platforms that you find yourself working in a lot? Knowing this sort of thing helps us to meet your needs. So Take a moment, this one might take a little longer. Check the boxes that are the tools that show up in your life day to day. Maybe all, maybe none, maybe somewhere in between. Okay, folks, about 10 more seconds. All right. Wow, we've got a whole bunch of GIS folks here. That's awesome. That's actually not always the case for uh, these workshops that we host uh, at the CalAdapt team. Um, certainly many folks having to do presentations and uh, work in spreadsheet programs. Uh, it's also lovely to see that we've got a few folks that are working in, in Python and R. Um, we're increasingly hoping to uh, meet the needs of a user base that works through scripting and coding tools. So um, fantastic. And if you don't do climate change analysis or reporting, also fine. I think this is everybody's battle these days, so glad to have you here. So with that, um, I've been keeping an eye on questions in the chat. Um, Jason asked a question about whether updates are made to the wildfire probabilities or data hosted in CalAdapt as major wildfires burn. Uh, and Nancy has indicated that that's a great question. The probabilities are produced from the fourth assessment climate modeling data from UC Merced. So it's a static data set. It is not updated as new wildfires burn. Um, we'll explore the next evolution of California's wildfire data in the webinar. Um, if you're on the CalAdapt listserv, the newsletter one, you'll get information about that webinar. There's also a registration link in the chat. All right. So with that, uh, I'm seeing one more question actually come in, which is, do you have references, e.g., a library by topic? And for that, that actually will be the theme of some of the second half of our webinar today, where we talk about the Adaptation Planning Guide 2.0 release and how it interfaces with what's called California's Adaptation Clearinghouse. If you go to resilientca.org, you'll find actually a repository of information on climate change adaptation in California, and you can organize it 
a variety of different ways, one of them being sector or the type of climate change impact anticipated. So we'll talk more about that later. It's a lovely question. All right, it's time for breakout groups. Nikki has made breakout groups based on what folks indicated they were most interested in. If people didn't offer up an indication of their interest, we've placed you somewhere and we think it'll be a great conversation no matter. So with that, you'll see a join breakout group button pop up. Please click it. going to go from what I see left to right. Um, Susie from Truckee Planning. You want to unmute. There we go. Yeah, I got it. Can you hear me now? Hi, I'm Susie uh, Tarnay. I'm the Truckee Planning Commission Vice Chair. Um, and I just am trying to direct our town towards more um, sustainable practices. And so I love to be able to pull up data occasionally to um, support my point of view. Great. Bonnie Turnbull? I'm, I'm from South Lake Tahoe. I serve on the 100% Renewable Committee, which is a citizen committee um, in support of city council. And I also serve on the school board. And then Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Mogadas from Spatial Informatics Group. Um, we do a lot of work on uh, fire hazard mitigation and starting on evacuation planning, pre-fire planning. So this work really helps us emphasize the problem today and then you know where it's going in the future, which I think is an important story to tell. Great, and Curtis? Did you have to unmute? Uh, yeah. Yep, I got, got to unmute button. Hi, I'm Curtis Alling. I'm principal with Ascent Environmental. We are a planning environmental and natural resources consultants, do a great deal of climate action planning and adaptation planning, including around the Tahoe Basin and elsewhere in the Sierra. And uh, we've been using CalAdapt for, for quite a while and uh, really appreciate uh, that, uh, that tool. And uh, Hey, Cynthia, I just wanted to say hello. I, I, I know I've seen you kind of hop in and out. So I wanted to see if you're having tech issues and if which breakout room you might want to join, if you can hear yeah, me. I wasn't sure which other breakout options. Um, I was put in hydro and um, 
would be more interested in policy and management? Yeah, so we have the local climate snapshot tool, and then we have the guidance one, and then the hydro. So uh, for policy and management, uh, that's probably the guidance one. Does that sound yeah, That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no problem. and all the other folks that are um, working towards developing the next generation welfare models to support the fifth assessment. Thanks for putting this on. Gotcha. Thank you for your work. Um, Simone, would you like to introduce yourself again? Yeah, I can do that. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Simone Cordery Cotter. I'm a climate analyst with Sierra Business Council. Um, my vested interest in attending this particular breakout group and, the, and this entire webinar is that we're currently working on a climate um, vulnerability assessment for the entire Sierra Nevada region. Um, so I'm very excited to see how we can continue to leverage CalADAPS data to do that. Gotcha. Uh, Susan. Hey everybody, um, I'm a paleoclimate researcher um, at a national laboratory and that means that I um, have a PhD in climate science so I know more about the ancient climate than I do modern climate and so I'm interested to use the tools. Um, my research mainly focuses around the Mono Lake Basin in the Eastern Sierra which is the most beautiful place in the world. I would endorse that. Um, I'm actually trained as a geologist myself so trying to pivot from looking back to looking forward to. Lastly is Yusuf. Hi, so my name is Yusuf, and I am actually a designer and I'm working with a small startup called uh, Climate Data Hub and I'm trying to inform myself about what climate data is, how is it being used, uh, and I was very excited to learn about this event. So. Well, great to have you all. Um, a little bit of what we're gonna do here now. Um, we are gonna talk about the types of resources that exist on CalAdapt to help you work with and interpret the data. And then more importantly, our demand study. Um, I've used it in the past life at another water agency in water supply analysis. So I'm really interested in looking at new tools and information that CalDoc has to offer and how that those tools can be used to actually present some of the information that's been discussed here. Great, welcome. So uh, I am going to, let's see, I think we do need to move on to the tool, but I don't want to stop anybody from introducing themselves. Um, does anyone want to jump on and say hi that didn't get a chance? Sorry about uh, taking a little too long with that. We certainly appreciate all of your time. Um, 
Uh, the chat is really great as well. If you haven't gotten a chance to uh, introduce yourself um, in person, feel free to do that in the chat. That's a really great way to do it as well. So hello, everybody. And with that, um, I do want to just briefly introduce our goals with this local climate change snapshot tool. So this tool sort of came out of what we've heard from many different users as we've done user needs assessment throughout the state. Um, there's a lot of people who, you know, with the, the main Caladap tools, there's a lot of uh, different parameters that users can enter, right? Users can change the time period, users can change the threshold, they can look at different RCPs. To, um, and uh, for some people that ends up being almost too complex. So we found that a, um, a certain number of users are looking for sort of a simplified tool where they can go and just get a bunch of different climate impacts from one location. So instead of entering the tools as you do, you know, most of the tools you enter the climate impact. So you look at wildfire or snowpack, then you pick your area and then you can use whatever thresholds or parameters you want. With this tool, we're trying to really simplify it and have the user just first enter their location and then get a suite of climate variables for that location in sort of a simplified form where you don't actually have to make a lot of selections as to what, you know, what model you want or what RCP you want. We just have that totally there for the user. And with that, I'm going to let Shruti Muktiar take it over. Shruti's our main developer on Caladap. She builds all of the beautiful tools, um, including this one. So Shruti, if you don't mind just introducing yourself and then sharing your screen and walking us through, uh, through the tool. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shruti Muktiar, and I work at the GIF as a web developer. I mostly work on uh, building the front end tools uh, with our team of uh, three developers. And um, I'm going to uh, share my screen and we can kind of and give you a quick overview of what the local climate snapshot tool looks like. Can you, can everyone see my screen? Yes, looks great. Okay. This is not. So uh, that spurred, you know, a lot of the lack of capacity we have for how we adapt our winter tourism economy um, for a potential future without skiing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's frightening. Okay. How have other folks added a layer of quantification to their work with future climate impacts? Or have you not? Has that been difficult? Or is that something you haven't thought to do? I'd love to follow this question a little further. And if raising hand is hard, feel free to type in chat, pick me or something, just want to avoid interrupting. Um, Simone, go for it. So we've been working on this vulnerability assessment and we're essentially extrapolating climate data and um, doing uh, for the region exactly what Nick was talking about for the town of Truckee. So taking a look at that climate data and seeing what the implications for that climate data are for social and economic systems within communities in the Sierra. Um, and this is, that's, that's really hard because, um, for example, we're looking at, uh, you know, in like an increase in projected smoke days, which, you know, the data set for which is kind of difficult to obtain. So we're looking at like historical AQI and that kind of thing. And then, <laughs> you know, then we'll have to look at like increase in acres burned and we'll have to make a lot of assumptions and fill in a lot of gaps about the data there. Um, and then, you know, the assumption is that, uh, you know, the assumption behind that is that all right, we've got folks rolling back in from all the breakout groups. So welcome back, everybody. Um, we'll give folks a few more seconds because I think there's still some people missing. All right. Well, we'll, we'll jump right in in these last few minutes here um, in hearing from each group. Just a quick summary of what folks talked about so that we can have a little bit of cross-pollination. Um, we'll do this until um, 2.30, at which point we'll take a short break. 
and we'll jump into the adaptation planning guide 2.0 portion of the day where you'll be introduced to that um, decision support system um, and, and then uh, get to offer some feedback on it because we hope it's maximally useful. Um, and Nikki from OPR will be facilitating that. So um, I'll start by talking about what the guidance group talked about. We were the folks who um, were trying to understand how climate change data can be made more accessible to folks who have to think about climate change adaptation, particularly through a quantitative lens, um, though not exclusively um, because increasingly a platform like CalAdapt is also serving as an educational tool to bring folks in who have never really thought about climate change um, in either a personal or professional context before. So um, things we, we talked about were some of the um, information needed for planning that goes one step beyond the physical change in our climate system. For example, thinking about not just wildfire, but also smoke impacts, um, or not just um, flooding in the Lake Tahoe Basin, but also how that might then impact infrastructure. Um, so having to think about how our social systems might map onto um, climate change um, and recognizing that's a difficult thing to attend to. Um, it often, as Simone from SBC pointed out, requires a lot of assumptions um, and a lot of community engagement to make sure that those assumptions are well-founded. Um, so that's a challenge that's on our mind, um, but folks are certain to think about it. For example, um, somebody who will be working on uh, wildfire data for the fifth climate assessment um, let us know that they hope that smoke um, forecasts, or sorry, predictions, projections will also come out of that. Um, other things we talked about were ways to work to develop climate leadership, whether that's a leadership academy or webinars that are specifically pointed toward folks that have, for example, political appointments or director type appointments who are starting to think about climate change for the first time. And then lastly, we also talked about how people like to learn new information, um, whether that is uh, YouTube tutorials, we got some endorsements for YouTube videos, um, maybe some sort of learning through doing, maybe a guided module where you're producing something to learn how to engage climate change data. Um, and then also what it's like to have somebody um, helping you to find information so that you're not on your own in your busy life, wandering around the wild web of climate change resources. So that was what we talked about and we'll be sure to distribute notes to the folks who signed up for this webinar after the fact. So let's pop to the next group, which Let's do Nancy and Shruti and the local climate change snapshot tool. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know how you had time to talk through all those things in your uh, breakout, Lucy. <laughs> it seemed to go by really quickly. Um, thank you to everybody who joined us. We had about 20 people um, in our breakout talking about the local climate change snapshot tool. So this is a tool that's in development right now um, and is hopefully close to being done and launched in the not too distant future. Um, the local climate snapshot tool is really geared towards um, people who uh, really geared towards local planners, uh, city governments, people who maybe don't want to explore all of the intricacies of CalAdapt's other tools, but really just want to um, go to a particular location and get a number of different climate impacts in a really simplified user-friendly tool. So we went through and Shruti did a demo of what that tool looks like now. Um, and we asked people for feedback on the tool and whether they had suggestions for improvements um, and we talked about some, some really useful things. One, uh, one idea was more guidance material, sort of related to um, Lucy's group. Somebody suggested that it would be helpful to maybe showcase, have case studies that show this is how a particular county maybe has used this tool to create their information and be able to share that as a case study with other users, which I think is really useful. Um, so something that we should think about more so that people can understand how they can actually use this information. We talked about some specifics within the tools, different boundary layers that people would like to see added um, to what we have right now and different variables. Somebody mentioned that snowpack would be really valuable to have in that tool as well. So that's data that we have on CalAdapt that would be um, straightforward for us to add. Uh, we talked a bit about the usability of the tool and whether folks thought it looked like it was, you know, understandable. Um, so that we got a, some positive responses on that. Um, 
and it seemed like people were interested. We've added some new functionality recently that allows people to, um, to access, to, to link to the adaptation clearinghouse, which I think is really useful. So you can, within the local climate snapshot, look at other resources and you'll be sent to the adaptation clearinghouse so that you can really um, access other resources. So it seems like all of those things will be valuable for folks. Uh, we gave them a link in the chat to play around with the tool themselves. So hopefully I'll get some more feedback. Uh, again, feel free to email me or support at CalAdapt if you do have any feedback. And thanks for everybody's time. Cool. How about Team Hydro? That was with Owen. Hi. Yeah. Um, our work group started off with a bathroom break, and that was wildly popular. Uh, and then we moved into a, uh, a overview of the hydrological information, which is on CalAdapt from Vic. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about what uh, drought planning, uh, drought tool development is going on. Um, and uh, a couple things came out. Um, the idea of linking up hydrological info information with a CEQA planning uh, was discussed uh, and the need for whatever tools CalADAPT develops to you know, feed into the, the way that local and regional planners are actually utilizing climate data. Uh, and a second uh, overarching theme that was discussed is that you know, on a statewide basis, um, we're, we're planning for the fifth assessment and we're hoping to go from six kilometers to two kilometers and that's a really great and important step. But is setting statewide goals appropriate uh, for resolution? Is, if the Central Valley could be resolved at six kilometers but the Sierras need 700 meter resolution to resolve the topographical diversity, um, should we be looking at regional scale um, resolution rather than statewide projection goals. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Owen. And last but not least was Team Small and Mighty R and ArcGIS. I'll take a stab at this one. So we, we, we talked about the R tool and the Py, Python tools that we are developing. And one thing that really came out of the conversation was the need to have the ability and look at the interplay between the different variables. So let's say fire and hydrology or fire scars and snowpack. Try to come up with ways to really um, work with multiple variables and figure out ways that those variables are gonna have interplay with each other. A prime example was fire scars and how they impact snow melt and the rate of snow melt. So just thinking about how those things in, uh, interact with each other is very important. And I think that we, we heard that uh, the users are excited about the tools we're developing and seeing how they can be used in their work. Yeah, we also asked people about what kinds of climate variables they're most interested in and mm -hmm. not surprisingly, uh, snowpack and water resources and fire were the top ones. Um, what kinds of time frames and horizons they're looking at and uh, the mid-century uh, also came out on top, not a surprise. Uh, adaptation planning tends to be in that time frame, uh, at least some of it. and. And yeah, we, we made a big pitch for people to join the beta testing club. So yes, we'll be doing another webinar in November on these tools. Yes. Great. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everybody. You'll get written notes from all of us on what the breakout groups talked about since they may be useful to you in your work. At this point, um, we're going to take a break. We will come back at 240 to talk about the adaptation planning guide. Um, the uh, wealth of resources that support adaptation planning processes um, that have been recently updated. So see you back here at 240.
All right, it is 240. So hopefully folks are trickling back in here. I see Simone, so I have at least one participant. <laughs> Hi, Simone. <laughs> I'll give folks another minute just to get settled in their seats again. Hope everyone is able to grab coffees, take a stretch, pet their animals. My animal is insisting on being parked directly on my feet. So if you <laughs> suddenly see my like camera jump up, it's because that's where my an my animal has suddenly decided to be elsewhere. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Okay, since we've got a lot to cover, I'm gonna go ahead and get started, but um, I'm gonna just assume everyone is back. Thank you all so much for being here and for um, staying for this extended workshop. I know three hours is a long time to stay engaged in the afternoon, especially with everything that's going on here. Um, so really appreciate everyone for being here. Um, I'm really excited to show you some of these resources, which we've been, um, a lot of folks have been working on over the last couple of years to make happen. So. Um, without further ado, let's get started. My name is Nikki Caravelli. I am an assistant planner at the Office of Planning and Research under the Climate Resilience Division, um, and I support the Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resilience Program, which I'll cover a little bit more about today. So here uh, today is our agenda. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about that program. I'm going to be introducing the 2020 update to the Adaptation Planning Guide. Then I'll give you a tour of the online interactive version on the Adaptation Clearinghouse um, and cover what those things are if you haven't seen them. And then at the end, I would love to invite your participation in a second breakout session to continue exploring the resources um, and also to give us feedback on how we did um, integrating all of this content into an online environment, making sure that helping us make sure that it's as accessible and useful as possible for you all and what you're doing. So just a little bit more about ICARP. Um, ICARP essentially, um, it was created by a bill in 2015, SB 246, um, to advance the statutory directive to, um, to facilitate a climate resilient California for all in a nutshell. So it's California's primary coordinating program for driving a cohesive coordinated response to climate change impacts across local, regional and state efforts. Um, with a particular focus called out in the legislation for prioritizing equity, as well as integrating both mitigation and adaptation. Um, I see my chat window popping up. So um, Simone, I'm just gonna rely on you to let me know if, um, if there's uh, clarification or technical issues that I should be aware of. Um, but so a little bit more about ICARP, we, um, we advanced this, this mission, the statutory directive through two, two primary vehicles, one is the Adaptation Clearinghouse, which is an online database of resources we'll be looking at later. And the second one is a technical advisory council made up of stakeholders from across California, um, which includes representatives from nonprofits, um, state agencies, local and regional agencies, tribes, um, et cetera, all folks with various sectoral backgrounds, energy, water, natural resources, um, providing guidance and oversight and recommendations on how California should be coordinating across these different local, regional, statewide levels and advancing our, our vision for resilience and climate change, making sure that all of our communities and voices are, are represented, that we're balanced. Um, and the Technical Advisory Council has advanced a vision statement and a, uh, a set of seven principles for advancing a climate resilient California. Um, if you want to find out more about this vision and the principles, as well as um, guidance that this group has created on defining vulnerable communities, you can check all of this out on our website at the OPR website here, and you can read our impact report on everything our program has accomplished. Um, we also have a listserv with email updates, so um, I can definitely share the link to you all for that at the end of this webinar. So just a little bit more about the Adaptation Clearinghouse. Um, it is an online searchable database, um, essentially built to assist decision makers at the state, regional, and local levels when planning for and implementing climate adaptation projects. Um, it has 
everything from case studies to um, links to external tools and data, scientific studies, um, example plans and projects, and all of these can be filtered by climate impact or sector. Um, and just a quick note that we would love for this, this site to be the be all end all of climate change resources for everyone in California, but that's not really our, our statutory directive or, or our charge here. Um, this, this resource is really limited um, in scope and capacity to building out resources for, for climate adaptation planners. Um, that being said, if you are representing a nonprofit or a community member or community effort or whatever, that doesn't mean that you can't use this clearinghouse or the resources on it for something that you're working on. But just understand that if you're not seeing some sort of climate change resource that is the most relevant for you, that's why we're, we're really curating this for planners and um, the adaptation planning context uh, required of local governments and regions in California. So just a, a little bit of level setting. Um, I do this with all of the regional workshops that we're participating in just to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of definitions. Um, so adaptation and resilience, what does this mean? Um, how, is, how is the state talking about this? These definitions are pulled from the adaptation planning guide, which I'll cover in more detail in a little bit. Um, but this is what I mean when I'm saying integrated climate adaptation and resiliency program. So adaptation is an adjustment in natural or human systems to a new or changing environment, which moderates potential harm or exploits beneficial opportunities brought about by the change. And resilience is the capacity of any entity, an individual, a community, an organization, or a natural system to prepare for disruptions, to recover from shocks and stresses, and to adapt and grow from a disruptive experience. And so we know that there's lots of definitions about adaptation and resilience out there and what that means for different folks, but this is our working definition for this workshop and, and from the state guidance perspective. Um, and just a quick note that a lot of folks on this call already know this, but um, adaptation and resilience really encompasses things that we're already working on. I know in the Sierra that we, we have to talk a lot about, well, well, what does it mean for wildfire? What does it mean in our communities where we have lots of different viewpoints about what climate change means, about the causation of climate change, et cetera. Um, but this conversation about adaptation and resilience crosses political divides, right? It's about economic development. It's about long range planning. It's about sustainability, hazard mitigation planning, these things that every community is interested in, no matter their political background. Um, so making that connection, like resilience doesn't have to be just about climate change. It's about all of these things. Let's work together um, is, is something that we're really um, seeing our, our vision at the state um, advancing. So um, just wanted to bring a quick note on that. Moving on from our definitions, I'm going to also do some Zoom polls now. Um, this will be relatively quick here, but I've got three questions here for you. Um, I'd love to just uh, get a sense for folks' experience in the room. We already asked um, a similar question about experience with climate change data. Um, I'm just interested, generally, what's your experience in adaptation planning, whether you've never done it at all or you're really advanced? And then our second question is, are you familiar with the adaptation planning guide? And uh, if, if so, uh, which version? Have you seen the 2012 version or the 2020 version or both? And then the last question is, have you used the adaptation clearinghouse? Have you heard of it? How much do you use it if you have seen it? So I'll just give about 15 more seconds for folks to answer all three of those questions. And I, I see a couple of chats coming through here um, from Lucy and Simone. So um, there's a question from a participant, were breakout groups recorded? I did not record the breakout groups, but I believe each group, each facilitator had a note taker um, and those will be distributed afterwards. And then also just a quick note that if you have questions, please feel free to um, drop them into the chat throughout this, this presentation and I'll, I'll try to pause periodically to address them and Simone will help me answer them. So I'm gonna end my poll now. Thank you all for participating. So it looks like um, almost half, I'd say 
yeah, okay, so more like 66% of folks either are not experienced or beginners um, when it comes to adaptation planning. Um, a little close to a quarter of folks have uh, moderate experience with adaptation planning, and only a couple of folks are more advanced um, according to their own ranking of their experience. So that's great. I'm really hoping that this adaptation planning guide will be really helpful for you then. Um, it's really supposed to be much more robust than um, existing guidance that we have in the state of California and very California um, context specific. Second question, are you familiar with the adaptation planning guide? Looks like over half of folks have not seen it. So that's awesome. Really excited to show it to you. Um, a couple of folks have seen either only one of the version or the other. I will cover briefly um, a couple of differences between the two versions just to point out um, some of the bigger changes that you can look out for. And then finally, the third question, have you seen the Adaptation Clearinghouse? It looks like about 40% of folks have not heard of it um, or an, and a similar chunk have either only used it once or twice or not at all. So that's awesome. I'm going to give you a tour of our brand new version and hopefully show you a couple of new interesting ways that you can use it um, and maybe that'll make it easier for you to see what sort of resources are are available on there. So thanks everyone for participating in this poll with me. Okay, moving right along to the Adaptation Planning Guide 2020 version. So the Adaptation Planning Guide was developed by the Office of Emergency Services originally in 2012. Um, to provide guidance to local governments on local adaptation and resiliency planning. It was developed as a set of four uh, separate documents um, and oriented to help both city, county, tribal, and regional governments in addressing climate change. Um, and, and it was really meant to, to put all together the latest adaptation resources and planning methodologies in one place. Um, since 2012, there have been substantial developments, as we all know, in the climate adaptation space, including much more conclusive science and tools, um, new best practices, um, an advanced um, community of, of practitioners, and progressive climate change adaptation legislation, such as SB 246 and SB 379. Um, and so, so the guide was updated. Um, one of these, one of these bills, SB 246, um, which created my program, the ICARP program, required that the adaptation planning guide be regularly updated to better facilitate and support local um, local folks in adapting to climate change. So the Office of Emergency Services, um, over the last couple of years, began updating it. Um, and that's uh, what you see here on the screen. We now have one 250 page document um, all in one, one place. Um, and we spent the last two years working with partners across the state updating this guide. So OPR, the Office of Planning and Resources worked with the Office of Emergency Services and the consultant team Placeworks and, and other folks to engage in a lengthy public engagement process. Some of you on this call probably participated in that. So thank you for, for being a part of that. Um, and just a quick note that um, now the, the format of the, the 2020 version is a little bit different. It's now a four phase process um, and it's been simplified. It's more flexible and it's much more responsive than the previous version. So a little bit more about what's in the adaptation planning guide, um, it connects what you can be doing at the local level and the planning context at the local level to the statewide vision um, and gives an overview of the priorities, principles, and strategic direction that the state is advancing um, through Safeguarding California, the state's adaptation strategy, as well as the ICARP program's vision and principles that our council developed um, and, and really connects that vision with how you can advance that at the local level um, and include that in your local visioning and, and process. It also includes links to external resources, tools, and additional guidance for diving into any particular topic more deeply. And there are examples woven throughout of how various communities have approached different parts of each planning phase. Um, the guide provides detailed information and steps on how to complete a vulnerability assessment and adaptation framework, assessments and costs, plan alignment and mainstreaming, funding options and techniques to support implementation, monitoring and evaluation, as well as addressing uncertainty. Overall, um, just for comparison to the 
Office of Planning and Research general plan guidelines, this set, the adaptation planning guide, um, is much more comprehensive and detailed in how it addresses and provides technical guidance on climate adaptation um, compared to the general plan guidelines. So just a quick note on that. And then um, one other important note is that the guide really strives to integrate equity and outreach into all phases of adaptation planning. Just a little bit more about how the adaptation planning guide was updated, led by the Office of Emergency Services. There was a um, interagency planning work group of about 35 representatives from state agencies and orgs across the state um, guiding the overall process. And then there was an intensive um, stakeholder engagement process, which looked something like this with listening sessions, presentations, interviews, and then um, a, a draft public review period last year. And then we wrapped it up and published the final guide in, 20, in, uh, in June 2020. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about each phase of the planning process covered in the guide. Um, it now follows a linear roadmap um, of four phases with outreach and engagement, as I mentioned, integrated into each phase. So within each phase is a series of sub steps and the planning team really did their best to simplify this overall process compared to the process that was presented in the 2012 version. The first phase of the guide is the scoping phase and what we're calling the explore, define, and initiate phase. This is new compared to the previous version. Um, it's really designed to make sure that as a planner, you're fully prepared for the effort ahead of you and that you know what's, what's going to be involved in this effort before you get started. The second phase is about creating your vulnerability assessments. And this was originally a four phase process in the first guide, but this has been much condensed. Um, and then the third phase is about defining your adaptation framework and strategies, building on the vulnerability assessment and prioritization you did in the previous step. This phase focuses um, on translating your vulnerability into a, into a policy framework. And then the last phase in the adaptation planning guide looks at what happens after your plan has been developed and adopted and emphasizes translating your plan on paper into real life and how to make sure that um, you're actually addressing the resilience needs in your community. Um, it also covers what to do if things aren't really working as planned, as if you need to um, adjust and change course and update as needed. So I'm not gonna cover each phase in detail. Um, the plan is available, or the, excuse me, the guide is available online for download in all of its 250 page glory. And you'll also be able to see it um, in its interactive online version in just a second. Uh, but as an example, I'll just cover briefly what's in phase one. So there's four steps in this initial phase. Um, the first step is motivation and scope, which is about confirming why communities are undertaking your adaptation planning process in the first place what you hope to get out of it, what are the broad parameters. The second step um, is about uh, identifying your teams and your resources and ensuring that the right people are involved and that you have what you need to get um, this whole project done. The third step is choosing the climate effects and the populations and assets in your community that you're going to analyze and really setting up, uh, for the, setting up the framework for the technical analyses to follow. And then, outreach and engagement um, really should be woven throughout all of these steps. So as if all of that and detailed guidance information wasn't enough, we have a ton of information in the appendices. So don't skip over this if you download the guide. Um, we have a robust glossary of definitions um, compiling the different adaptation and climate related terms that are used throughout the guide. Then Appendix A summarizes each of the 11 economic sectors that are covered in the guide um, and they align with the sectors of safeguarding California. Um, and this, this appendix defines each sector and describes uh, the major climate vulnerabilities related to each sector. Appendix B is an overview of the adaptation pathways approach, um, which is a, a bit of a more technical approach to adaptation planning. Um, and it provides the basics and key steps if you want to delve into this a little bit more deeply. Appendix C includes detailed descriptions of state, federal, and non-governmental non resources. 
And then the final appendix provides examples of adaptation strategies um, and it includes also links to other communities that have used them as examples, um, sector overlap, uh, potential responsible agencies, other factors to consider if, you, if you're using that strategy. So I'm gonna just pause there to see if anyone has any questions about the guide itself. I haven't seen my chat window pop, so go ahead and type into the chat if you do have questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions come through, but if you think of them, um, feel free to keep chatting, uh, typing them in. Nikki, we do have one question from um, Yusuf. Oh, and we have another one, another comment, another ask from Mark. Um, Yusuf's question is, who are adaptation planners? So I, I think um, who's doing adaptation planning and who would be utilizing this guide, I think, is what that question is aimed at. Yusuf, feel free to correct me if I misinterpreted. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So this guide um, is really oriented primarily to local governments in California, so um, city and county level planning efforts. Um, but however, it can be used at the regional level. So if you're an MPO or a regional agency or a tribe, this guidance is relevant for you. Um, it does cover guidance, uh, just as this is a side note that I forgot to mention, it does cover how communities can meet SB 379 adaptation planning requirements. Um, within the guide. So um, all communities in California are required to create an adaptation strategy and vulnerability assessment. This guide um, does cover in detail how you do that. Um, and so even though this guidance set is really mostly geared towards local governments, um, it's a broad set of guidance that can be applied in any context really if you're if you're willing to extrapolate. So from an organizational standpoint or um, you know any sort of community organizing standpoint, you can take the, the broad framework of these steps of scoping and then doing a vulnerability assessment and then creating your strategies and prioritizing them and then implementing them and take that same framework and apply it to whatever your, um, your jurisdiction is, if you will. Thank you, Nikki. We also have one more question from Mark. His question is, what if you've already completed a vulnerability assessment? If you've already completed a vulnerability assessment, then you might be most interested, if you haven't done any adaptation strategy setting yet, um, maybe that's next for you if you're, if you're a local government. It really depends on, on, um, on your community context and, and what your community needs to do. Um, I, so it's, it's a little bit difficult for me to answer that question, not knowing too much about your community and what you might already have in place. If you already have a climate action plan or something, in mind or whatever. Um, if, if you're specifically referring to planning requirements set for cities and counties, a vulnerability assessment is required, but also adaptation strategies and goals are required and implementation measures. Um, so if you, so and getting um, one further bit to this answer, um, typically after a vulnerability assessment, you would take um, your vulnerability results and prioritize them based on, on what you think is most um, achievable to try to address and develop strategies and actions based on those vulnerabilities and go through a, a community process to identify what is most important to your community and identify ideas um, that you across the community and your local jurisdiction um, can work together to, to move forward and advance a vision for resilience. Thank you, Nikki. I think that's all we have in the chat at the moment. Awesome. Okay, I will move on to the next segment here then. So the next step for the adaptation planning guide, uh, now that it's in its print form and 250 pages um, and available for download, we have been working to transition it into an interactive online version. Um, with the understanding that 250 pages is a lot of content. There's a lot of resources and technical details out there 
And so uh, we were trying to figure out a way to, to make it easier for folks to engage with the guidance as well as the resources based on where they are in, in, in respect to their planning process at the local level. So we uh, worked with the Office of Emergency Services and their PlaceWorks, um, their consultant team and the Geospatial Innovation Facility, the folks here on, um, that led the Cal Adapt workshop earlier um, to create this vision for what the online version could look like and really wanted it to be accessible, searchable, easily navigable, interactive, and ideally include downloadable checklists and templates so that you can take the guide, take the resources from this one-stop shop website and hit the ground running. This was our process, so we've, we've had a pretty condensed timeline um, with getting up a beta version of the update so we're putting the, the, I don't know if I said this, we're putting the adaptation planning guide onto the adaptation clearinghouse. Um, and so we've been working on a beta version of the new adaptation clearinghouse with adaptation planning guide. And now we're, we're, we're wrapping up our public feedback process. This is our last regional workshop. Um, and then we'll, once we've integrated our feedback, we will publish live on resilientca.org in November. Yeah, I just, I covered, uh, yep. So we did our introductory webinar at the beginning. Um, we also featured a couple of equitable adaptation planning resources from the Georgetown Climate Center and the Green Lining Institute. Um, and I'm happy to share the recording of that um, because those are some great resources um, with folks on this call. We're doing nine regional workshops and then um, we have some online surveys and web analytics, which we'll be inviting you to participate in through this workshop. And then this Friday, we'll be presenting all of the feedback and integrating it um, at the Technical Advisory Council on October 2nd. So before I do the, the tour of the online version, which I'm really excited to show you, I'm just gonna pause there and see if there looks like there's a couple more questions coming through. Nikki, Lucy was asking, do you anticipate having hands-on, quote unquote, how to use technical assistance sessions as this rolls out? Um, BYO, climate data, bring your own climate data, question mark. That is a great question, Lucy. Um, I would love to continue hosting webinars and workshops, but I honestly can't say at the moment what my capacity will look like in 2021. We're all dealing with budget cuts, and so unfortunately, our the ICARP program generally has had to scale back and also deal with some staffing challenges. So um, that is to say that there's a lot in flux right now. I would like to, that is definitely a priority for us, um, but I can't say with a certainty what's next once we publish online. Okay, no other questions, then I am going to switch my screen share here and explore the new site with you all. Okay, so you should now be able to see folks on a beach. Welcome to the beta version, the beautiful new version of the Adaptation Clearinghouse. So we'd love your feedback on how we did. For those of you who are seeing it for the first time or folks who are seeing um, this, the who have seen the previous version and are now looking at it um, in the new version. We'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on whether you think this site is accessible, how we can improve it overall, et cetera. And that, that'll be what we'll cover in the breakout rooms. But I'll just give a quick orientation for folks who haven't been here before. So the main point of this site is, is it's a searchable database. So that's why we have this search bar. So you can search for whatever you might be looking for um, about adaptation planning in California whether you're looking for um, information on like a guide, the adaptation planning guide. Maybe you're looking for guidance on how to do an adaptation plan. Maybe you're looking for examples of how communities nearby you have done an adaptation plan. So you can use this site search to search for examples, guidance, tools and data, case studies, et cetera. And we have now, um, we've added a couple of new features. We have this suggest a resource button. We're always looking for new resources. So we tried to make that more accessible and, and visually um, upfront. We also now have a glossary of all of key terms and acronyms that we will be updating as the adaptation practice 
um, evolves and new terms are developed in the space. And scrolling down the site, um, we featured some of our most popular resources and some of the premier state resources, so the general plan guidelines, for instance. Um, we would update these with any like new major state updates um, on resources that we really want to feature. And then we have recent additions, so you can see what was most recently updated and the most popular resources on the site, uh, most viewed. And just a quick note that the resources that are here um, shown today are not, um, they are not reflecting the full library that we have on the live version of the Adaptation Clearinghouse. So um, just a quick note that if you're not seeing something that should be on there, it, it potentially is because it's on the live version and not on the beta version. So going back up to the top here for the orientation, um, we've organized the site into a couple of main different categories. The first, which I'll dive into um, in just a bit here, is the Adaptation Planning Guide. But before we do that, I want to go to the main site search. So say I am interested in the Sierra Nevada um, Just going to type random words and see what pops up. So looks like there are three, four results for a Sierra Nevada vulnerability. So I can take a look at these resources. Say I'm just doing a vulnerability assessment for the regional, for at a regional basis for the Sierra Nevada region. Maybe that's what I would type in here and see what's in there. Maybe I, maybe I don't want, maybe that's not enough resources. Maybe I want to see generally what's available for me in the region. I can clear this search. Bear with me while it slowly updates. Okay, it's going very slowly, sorry. Like the cert, the clear function is not working. There we go, okay. So I can now click on the Sierra Nevada region and 42 results are populating for everything that is tagged Sierra Nevada. So now I have a lot more stuff that I can sort through. 42 is quite a lot though. So maybe I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, but I know that I am interested in wildfire. I can sort the resources by wildfire. So now it looks like um, making sure that the Sierra Nevada tag is still there. There are 20 results populating. Say I am interested in starting a climate change plan. I've never done it before. I can click on phase one, see everything that might be useful for me in exploring, defining, and initiating, and scoping my project. I can also look at all the different types of resources. So maybe I want um, to see example projects. Looks like nothing's showing up there. But you can also filter by topic. So maybe you're interested in forestry here in the Sierra, and maybe you're interested in equity. You can also click that. You can also support, sort each um, resource by their author. So whether it's a, a federal agency, maybe the US Forest Service, or a local agency, state agency, or a tribe. And just a couple other ways that you can sort resources. You can sort by county. So you can zoom into Inyo County and see right now there's nothing populating. You can also hide the map. You can hide the filters. And you can sort um, further more by author. So this is sorting all of the resources below here by author, etc. So that's our main site search. It's really meant to be the main point of this site in addition to the adaptation planning guide. So let us know what you think of that um, during the breakouts. But I'm going to dive now into the other sections of the site. So the Adaptation Planning Guide. You can add, access any chapter of the guide, each of the four phases immediately, depending on what you're most interested in. Right off the bat, maybe you just want to download it, you can do that. If you have no idea what adaptation planning is, you don't know um, what the state context is or state laws or anything like that, maybe you want to dive into the introduction, so you can do that. And then we have the supporting resources. This is all from the appendix chapters down here. So say I'm just getting started. 
I can check out the introduction. I can download the introduction chapter by itself if I'd like to. I can read about what the purpose of the guide is, how to use it, learn about statewide climate efforts and important considerations before starting, such as equity and uncertainty. Now I'll just show you a couple of the different chapters. I'm not going to go into every part of this section because it's a lot of content, but I hope you all will spend some time with it um, and give us feedback on how we did. So phase one, just a, a couple of notes about each phase chapter and how it's presented. Over here on the left, you can click to see all of the phase one resources that we have in the Adaptation Clearinghouse. You can download the chapter and you can also download templates and checklists that we've developed to support this content. If you scroll further down the page, you can actually see a site search for all of the resources in the clearinghouse that are related to phase one. You can explore all of the content, the guidance content itself in phase one. I'm just going to show you phase four because it's designed a little bit differently and we'd love your feedback on um, the comparison between how phase one through three are designed versus phase four. Let us know if one seems more intuitive and easy to use um, than the other. So for this one, the stepwise buttons are presented on the side, the downloads are on the, si on the right side instead of the left side. There's a little bit more information on the front. You have to click here to access the steps, and then you click here to access the resources instead of scrolling. Just a, a different way to present the information. So going back to the home page, say I'm interested in understanding those vulnerabilities by sector that are covered in the appendix, and I'm interested in the adaptation example at adaptation strategies from the guide appendix. I can click on these pages and explore more information by sector. So here's a little bit of introductory content. Um, what is the agricultural sector? These tabs on the top are appendix content. So this is information about climate vulnerability taken from the adaptation planning guide on agriculture. And then we have the ad example adaptation strategies. Going back to the main page here, we have featured state resources supporting agriculture and we have all of the resources tagged for agriculture. So say you want to access all of this information, you don't want to go back to the adaptation planning guide. It's actually available here in the main navigation. We're not confident that we organized this correctly, this navigation. So let us know what you think of how it's organized. Um, so we've highlighted three topics that we have seen are, are popular to our users, but let us know if that seems counterintuitive or a little funky. Again, if you want to see all of the adaptation topics, if you want to check out forestry, you can go through the navigation here and access the same information. A quick note on a couple of other areas before we wrap up and dive into our breakout rooms. Um, we have some curated content on the Adaptation Clearinghouse called ICARP Case Studies. And these are organized by solutions to common challenges faced by adaptation practitioners. So these are really, we work with um, communities or organizations who are, are working on an adaptation plan or a project um, to, to get their story and put it in a, in a consistent format so that you can look at all of this and see consistently, okay, how did folks take an SB1 adaptation planning grant, for instance, from the Caltrans and turn that into an adaptation plan? We have a series of case studies on that. Um, and each one covers, for instance, the funding and the partners and the outputs and the in inputs and the, the regional context and the data used, et cetera, et cetera. So the case studies are really awesome um, examples of resources that you might be interested in if you're just starting out or if you're looking for examples or ideas of what to do. And then uh, we also have some cool new features in the tools and data section of the site. So first off, we have a regular site search. This is all of the tools and scientific studies on the clearinghouse. 
We also have our featured state resources in case you want to learn a little bit more about the fourth climate assessment or CalADAPT. And then we also have a nifty new tool comparison feature. So if you're trying to figure out what data projection tools are out there or where you can download the data or visualize different aspects of climate vulnerability or, or whatnot, um, there's a lot of tools out there. And so we tried to curate a few and pre present them here and make it easier to compare and contrast and choose them. Right now we have 24 tools uploaded here. So CalADAPT, you can see right off the bat, but each tool um, is presented with information specific to climate tools. So what type of outputs it has, what the data resolution is, um, what you can expect from each tool. And you can use this site filter at the top to filter by what is most interesting to you. So maybe you're interested in drought and wildfire here and forestry. So now the tool, now this um, is pulling up five different tools that you can compare. So we're really excited to have this tool on here, but let us know how we did um, and if we can improve this in any way. And finally, we do have this about section. If you want a little bit of assistance learning how to use this site or more background on why this site exists. So with that, I'm going to wrap up my tour. I think I covered everything that I wanted to. Let me just check real quick. Yeah, okay. So does anyone have any questions on the online version of the Adaptation Clearinghouse before we dive into breakouts? Nikki, what is the process, this is Simone from SPC, um, what is the process for submitting additional um, resources to the Clearinghouse? Yeah, so we have that button that I flagged on the Clearinghouse. You can also email me um, at icarp at opr.ca.gov. Um, and we, we accept resources uh, from anybody and it has to be California specific or have like a, a specific California nexus. So for instance, if someone sends us um, an example strategy from Florida, that's great and all, but the clearinghouse has to have California examples. So um, we also provide, um, it has to fit within our main resource categories. So you can, you can check that on our, on our site search um, what the different categories of resources are. It has to be like a case study or example policy guidance or um, an adaptation plan or something like that. Um, so we, for instance, we don't, we don't put the Sierra Club on here or like a nonprofit page on here. We, we have to put um, specific discrete resources that are useful for the adaptation planning process. And we try not to, um, to highlight specific organizations. It's all about the resource and the tools. And also each resource has to be free um, and publicly accessible. And if there's a download, it needs to be easily downloadable. Great question. Thanks, Simone. So I'm just going to ask, um, while folks are, if there's any other questions, type them in. But my colleague, um, Alyssa, to share the survey link and the, um, the link to the development site in the chat. I think she just did. So thank you, Alyssa. Um, so if everyone could open up that survey link and then make sure you can answer the first couple questions. Let us know what you think of the site after viewing our virtual tour. And then we will dive into breakouts. So please make sure you have both the survey link and the beta site open on your browser. We'll have about 30 minutes here. We can wrap up around 3.50. Um, so everyone will go ahead and explore the site on their own with their groups and answer the survey questions. Then we'll come back and do a report back and then we'll wrap it up here. Thanks everyone for listening. So we can, we can go ahead and dive into our breakouts now. When that button pops up on the screen, go ahead and just jump in there.
Mark saying, yes, great, glad to hear it. I can also share my screen so you can have a sense of what we're up to. Um, the first question you'll see in the survey is, um, what's your organizational context where you work? And then the second is this question, what are your reactions? And I'm gonna be quiet here for a few minutes while folks take the time to answer that. When you're done, just drop in chat, done, and we'll talk about the next question together. Is that working with your process, Nikki? That works great. Thanks so much, Lucy. I'm just gonna pop in and out to check on breakout rooms, but. You got it. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. There. So um, thanks for doing what you do. Uh, that's it for me. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, anyone else want to jump in or we can start uh, uh, going over the survey and the beta site. Nikki, we already heard from you. If you want to tell us one thing that gives, brings you hope. Hi everyone, I'm just popping in to see how everyone's doing. Um, I get hope from doing these workshops actually because I've been, I've just been, so many people have been coming to them, um, like over 800 people have signed up for a regional workshop, which is really exciting um, to see that many people engaged and interested. And also that a lot of people hadn't heard of the Adaptation Clearinghouse or the Adaptation Planning Guide before the workshop. So um, it, it's, it's really exciting to me to be able to, to talk to people and get feedback on these resources and share them with people. So that brings me hope. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Nikki. Um, I'm going to go pop out to another breakout room because okay, it'll sure. like, need my help, but thank you. Ended up needing to like clear Cation history and things like that to reactivate. So I don't know. Maybe that'll help. Nikki, uh, Owen got a message saying, um, thank you for answering it. Your feedback is appreciated before section one had even showed up. It was just the first two questions. Oh, four. Um, yeah, Owen, had you done the survey already or? No, not the, no, I don't believe so, but I, I opened a new browser and it's working great, so. Oh, interesting. Well, that must be a technical glitch. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> uh, it sounds like you, uh, Lucy was saying something about clearing your cache, then I think that's also an option. <laughs> I'm beta testing your survey. <laughs> You've got a doppelganger that already did it. Um, how's everybody else doing? Um, Steve, Mark, Nick, and James, do y'all need more time? James saying good to go. To go through the whole thing would be really tough. I mean, <laughs> this is, you know, kind of a pop quiz real quick here, so. Um, yeah. I, I, how much detail, I mean, you're asking for suggestions and, and I'm being pressed to know if I'm done. So I don't know, <laughs> there's a kind of a, a toss up there. Yeah, we're just looking for some quick responses early and then we have more time with some of the additional questions to um, dive into more specifics. But if you'd love more time to write a narrative, this no, is- no, really I'll, I'll, I'll get quicker, I'll get quicker. I'll, I'll do what I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll get 
time. Feel free to to finish the survey later. Like if that's what you want to do and it's more useful or helpful for you to just focus on clicking around and exploring and, and sharing with us verbally what you're experiencing, that's totally fine too. No pressure. <laughs> I'll just say wow. We'll start with that wow. Wow is in wow, great sight. <laughs> Wow! Wow is an amazing site. Yeah, so I've oh, used wow. the I've, cool. <laughs> I've used the four parts and had to get them laminated together and drag them around. And the idea of it all being online and searchable was really exciting. So oh, that's wow, so cool. good. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Mark. I like that. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go check on a couple other breakout rooms I haven't visited yet. Sounds good. I'll keep poking around. Yeah, do that. I'm happy to also just kind of hang and float around the background if folks are excited to work through this on their own time. Two questions. Um, I'm going to answer it on my end too, and then I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to go ahead and um, walk through the site together and answer the questions, um, answer the questions uh, to the survey as we go through. So um, I'm here to take notes and to kind of um, point my mouse in various directions on the screen as people need. And um, let's uh, just have a really um, organic conversation about this fabulous website that somebody put together. Oh, Nikki, hi, I didn't even see you there. <laughs> I'm just here, I'm, I'm popping in and out to make sure folks are doing okay and answer any questions, so. Awesome. Yeah, feel free um, to speak without me. <laughs> no, that's fine. I was gonna ask the group, um, we can either um, go through, like we can either like kind of poke around together or we can answer the questions as we go or um, I, I don't know if anybody has a strong preference in this group for the format that we use. We just do all the things. All right, give me just a sec. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Sounds like you guys got it under control. So I'm gonna go check on breakout room number four. <laughs> all righty, thank you, Nikki. Sure that, and yeah, I'll keep an eye on the clock, and then I will start kind of prompting some of these survey questions. Hi, Nikki. Hey, Jill. I'm just popping in to see how you all are doing and see if there's any any questions. Great. Yeah, we just started kind of exploring the link. I decided to, to rather than screen share um, with a small group, go ahead and let people um, dive in. But that being said, if anyone has questions, here is the expert. So anything I can't answer, here she is. Nikki, I'm not sure if this is a question for you, but I'll um, take the opportunity to express the fact that I've been trying to get more familiar with the California resources, departments, and websites that have to do with climate change. And there are a dozen or more, at least. And it would be really great to have some sort of CA.gov level organization of what different departments are involved in climate change, climate adaptation, climate data, and then have that posted on the website of each one of the departments that are on that sheet so that it's easier to know like who actually is CalAdapt. Are they part of the Department of Water Resources or the governor's office or, you know, there's just, there's so many different state offices that are involved. Yeah, that's, um, that's great feedback. And I'm glad that you said that because I think that there should be something like that as well. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, in the, in the Brown administration, there was the climate website that they had um, giving an overview of all of the climate executive orders and state climate activities and holding it all together. And that's now disappeared. Um, so in lieu of that, at least on the adaptation clearinghouse, our, our purview is only things that are adaptation related, but I am working on updating. Um, there is a page on there dedicated to state adaptation efforts. So we're trying to pull together some way to visually present how all of the different agencies are working together, their different programs and their different resources. Sorry, I'm slightly distracted by my background, which sometimes gives me like a little weird like hat when I move. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird. Anyway, um, so yes, I'm trying to um, create something like that on the adaptation clearinghouse. And if you can put that in the survey, <laughs> then we can. We'll do that. Do Great. That. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for that.
And Nikki, while you're here as well, um, just to clarify for my um, kind of frame of reference, are we doing um, this link that um, we, like I noticed on the link here where um, we are on resilient cal, uh, resilientca.org, um, should we go specifically into the planning guide and just talk about that, or do we want to kind of browse all these tabs at the top here? I was muted. Um, yeah, I would say do spend some time on the adaptation planning guide. Um, it is there is a lot of content there, so mm -hmm. I would say probably try to spend more of your time on that. Um, but I am interested in your any general feedback on the other sections as well. So probably the site search. Um, okay. Perfect. Thanks, Jill. Yeah, and um, yeah, before we dive into the specific um, survey questions, which again is that second link there, um, I'd love to hear if anyone has any other general thoughts. I mean, I think overall it is, as someone who's not, who doesn't work as a planner, it is a well laid out information. I can see how you would navigate to all the different, um, different sections. Um, for reference for everyone besides Claire and Nikki, I work in communications. So um, yeah, so that's why it's great to have her hop on here and provide the, the extra layer of detail. Um, any other thoughts? And feel free to throw them out there as we go through the survey as well. Um, it looks like, so the survey is broken out into three sections. We probably won't finish them in the time we have here, um, but feel free to just keep it in your browser and submit it when you, uh, when you can. Um, and so the first section is going to be about orientation, so how you kind of navigate around the site. Um, the second section is about, is more so about the technical content. And then the third section is about the overall experience of the site. So let's go ahead and if you don't have it open, open up that link here and um, if you, if any of these questions that come up, anyone wants to talk through them, feel free to unmute yourself at any time and throw out a comment. Um, um, yeah, the, the first uh, question is, can you find what you're looking for? So really um, think if you, um, you know, or you come to the site on your own, like kind of critique it for the, the ability to find the resources that pertain to your particular role. Sounds like you guys have got it covered. I'm gonna go check on another group. Cool, thanks Nikki. Hey Brian, how's it going? <laughs> I don't know if you're there. 